Wednesday morning. Here we are, November the 23rd, 2022. And you know what today is, right? The day before Thanksgiving. Tomorrow is Thanksgiving, and I pray that you have a wonderful, blessed, and safe day on tomorrow. Don't worry about eating too much. Go ahead and let it all hang out and just enjoy yourselves, all right? Good deal. I'm Isaac Whitehead Jr., and I have the privilege of serving as the senior pastor of First Baptist Church, 1810 Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard, Gainesville, Georgia. And we are so grateful to God to have this opportunity to come before you today with our Wednesday's Word, with our Bible study message here on each Wednesday. Now, I think I said good morning, but it's really more like afternoon. So please forgive me. Uh, running a little late today. Uh, I've kind of been in a running battle with Facebook over the last few weeks. Uh, you know, they don't like it when I talk politics. They don't like that. Uh, but anyway, I'm sure we'll get it worked out. But appreciate you being with us today. And uh, you may need to help me out. They may not air my message. They may not put it up there again. They've sort of restricted me a little bit. And uh, we're trying to work that out. But in the meantime, I still need for you to, especially on YouTube, to like, subscribe, and share, if you will. All right? Thank you very much. And I would appreciate it so much. And by the way, I'm hoping that you'll vote. We're in the runoff period. I'll check your registrar's office to see what day uh, you can vote early. But please get out there as early as you can, certainly before December the 6th. That's the uh, election day. So we'll make sure you get out there at least before that, or at least by then, uh, if you will, and vote, of course, for the candidate of your choice. You're grown, you're intelligent, and you're well able to make your own decisions. But if you have any problem and need a little help, I don't mind. Just give me a call, and I'll be glad to try to steer you in the right direction, okay? All right. But as long as God is on the throne, we're going to be fine. So we are not sweating it, but we have a responsibility. We have an obligation. Amen. To do our part and make sure that we vote. All right? Well, we're going to dive right in. Not going to do our usual intro. So grab a cup of coffee and uh, get you a donut or something. And, uh, and, and come on in. It's, it's time to get started. So let's get it done. Okay, come on. All right. Well, thank you again for being with us. And again, I pray that you are blessed uh, uh, every time you join in, every time you hear a message, every time you watch a video. I want you to be blessed. I want you to be helped. Okay? That's my goal. I'm not here just to talk to hear myself talking. I am doing my best to do what the Lord has called me to do. Okay? All right. Well, we're going to be in Philippians chapter 3, and I want to look at verses 1 through 11. Philippians chapter 3. A lot of good verses uh, and uh, uh, passages in the book of Philippians. Uh, this is Paul's letter uh, to the church at Philippi. And what I want to uh, uh, try to highlight uh, in this book, in this particular passage that we'll look at today, and that is chapter 3. Verses 1 through 11. I want to look at how, and this just shows a little part of it, but how Paul, how God changed his life. And then how he changed his life for the sake of God. I say God changed his life. And then I want you to see how he changed his life for the sake of God. Now, for many of us, God has already moved. God has already uh, 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 saved us. God has already done his part. Some of us have not done our part. God has changed us, but we have not changed. I say God has changed us, but we have not changed. Okay? I'll explain that as we go along. But I want to look at how Paul uh, deals with this change that God has brought about in his life. And how he willingly, deliberately purposely gave up his old life in order to live for God, in order to live for Jesus Christ, to do the work of Jesus Christ. Led, of course, 
by the Holy Spirit of God. So that's what I want us to see here in this book in uh, Philippians chapter number three. And please uh, pay attention to that because uh, I, I want to talk about uh, what am I living for if not for you? And we're going to see that, that uh, through here and then in other passages, how Paul is sold out for the Lord. There's no doubt about where he stands with God. There's no doubt that he has moved from his old life and has now moved into, if you will, his new life. Again, God changed him and then he changed. That's what is required of us, my friend. When God changes us, then we have to do our part while here on earth to change our lives, to change everything about us because now everything is God-centered. Everything is on the foundation of our faith in God. Okay, so let's look at it. And uh, I want to begin with, listen, let me, let me ask you to do this. Would you just read that entire chapter, uh, chapter 3 of uh, Philippians? And let me kind of jump down, uh, skip those first few verses, and, uh, and, and get a little bit further down uh, where Paul talks about how he has changed. God changed him, but then he began to take some steps in order to change his own life. Let's pick up at verse 5. He says, Circumcise the eighth day of the stock of Israel of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law, he says, I was a Pharisee. I was a, a some may even call a zealot, one who is zealous, who is excited about what he was doing. But at that time, he was only excited about going against the church, going against Christians. But God has touched him now. Okay, so he is looking back and saying that that, that, that I was there. And he, he describes himself in another place as I was the chiefest of sinners. Nobody could have done any more wrong than I was doing, Paul was saying. Okay, so verse 6 says, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness of God, the righteousness which is in the law. He says, I was blameless. I did the wrong, and I was good at doing the wrong. I was at my best doing the wrong, okay? Then he said, yea, doubtless, verse 8. Uh, no, I'm sorry, verse 7. He said, but what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. He says that everything that I had worked for, everything that I had built, everything that I had built up to, he says, when Jesus Christ touched me, when God changed my life, those things that used to be important to me, those things that were essential to me, he says, now I count all of that as, as lost. He says, that which I had been pride, uh, proud of, he says, I am now ashamed of, in so many words he's saying that. Okay, so he says, now uh, I did my part, I did my dirt, if you will. And I did it well. But when God touches your life, my friend, I don't care how low you are. I don't care what you have done in your life. When God touches your life, he's going to turn it around. I said, he's going to turn it around. He is going to change your life. Okay? So Paul says, I was a Pharisee. I was strict. I was zealous. He says, uh, again, concerning zeal, persecuting the church. Touching the righteousness which is in the law. He says, I was blameless. But all those things that were gained to me, those accomplishments, he says, I count it as loss for Christ. Listen to what he says in verse number uh, 8. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency. I count all things but lost. Are you hearing me? I count all things, he says, everything. Everything. I count all things but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung that I may, <clears throat> excuse me, that I may win Christ. Are you hearing what he's saying there? Paul says, everything that I have worked for, everything that I had built, everything that I stood on, 
all of that which I took pride in, nothing, nothing. It means absolutely nothing to me now. He said, because uh, Jesus has touched my life. Jesus has changed my life. I am no longer the man that I used to be. He said, I, I suffer loss of all things. He says, and I count them but dung that I may win Christ or that I may please Christ. And then he says in verse 9, uh, and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law. Having my own righteousness, which is of the law. He said, but that which is through faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. He says, uh, watch what he does now, uh, because this is, what, this is what has to happen between you and me. We have to... Um, uh, give up what we used to value. Give up what we thought was everything. Give up even sometimes what we thought was right. Give all that up. Count it but dung. But now strive for, seek, pursue a good relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Look what he says. He says that I may know him and the power of of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. He says, being made conformable unto his death. Verse 11 says, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Amen. Paul says, my life has changed. Listen now, because I'm going to keep coming back with this. My life has changed and therefore I am changing my life. That's enough to shout about right there. My life has changed, and therefore I am changing my life. I am changing my outlook on life. I am changing my attitude towards life. I am changing my actions in life. God has turned me around, and therefore I am going to turn around. <laughs> Amen. He has opened the gate and set me free. Therefore, I am going to walk in freedom. Hallelujah be to God. Yes, 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 yes. And, and I know some of you are wondering, uh, where did he come up with that subject? Now, some of you already know because you heard the song. But when I look at things like that, when I listen to songs, and when I read even, um, what do you call them, uh, 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 cards, or thank you cards, or love notes, or whatever, um, um, when I, when I read that, when I listen to some of the music, it is a mystery and it's uh, somewhat of a problem. Because I'm wondering, how do we find so many good things, lovely things to say about one another when we can't seem to find good things to say about God? I mean, I've never given them much thought until now. Never saw the differences until now. You know, regardless of the genre, whether it is blues, country, R&B, rap, classical music, whatever, gospel, whatever it is. Listen, how is it and why is it that we are able to much more, to, to be uh, much more expressive with our relationships with one another than we are with our relationship with God? That's why I have to say, uh, what am I living for? Uh, if not for you, you remember that song, but there have been many others. There are many others, my friend. How do we find all of these good things to say through our birthday cards and anniversary cards and Valentine cards and through the songs that we sing? Sounds great. And yet when it comes to God, we cannot even seem to strike up a praise. And I'm talking about God, the creator of the universe, God who created you and me. And I know what we say. We say, we praise God. We praise God and we adore him. And that is absolutely correct. We do praise God. We do adore him. But those expressions, those expressions there are nothing like the praise and the honor we heap upon one another. I mean, let's face it. When was the last time you heard somebody say uh, of God, I swim the deepest ocean for you? When did everybody say, uh, I'm too busy thinking about my God, ain't got time for nothing else. <laughs> I will always love you. What about these arms of mine? What about somebody saying, I climbed the highest mountain for you? 
What about this one? I stand accused of loving you too much. Take me back. I'm begging, please take me back. I'm on my knees. You say that to a woman, but have you said it to God? Are you hearing me, my friend? Then to get to our subject, to get to our topic for the day, uh, that old classic that was originally uh, recorded by Chuck Willis and then later on by Percy Sledge, among many others. There were many people who recorded it. And that is, what am I living for if not for you? And it goes on to say, and nobody else will do. What am I living for? This is talking to an individual. Why can't we talk to God like that? Why can't we lavish God like that with love? Why can't we say that to God? And it's not just a question, but it's a statement. And, you know, and as we talk about that, what am I living for, God, if not for you? I'm living for you. What else could I be living for? I am living for you. And it reminds me, when Jesus looked at his disciples, some of them had already walked away. And, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. And he says, uh, will you also go away? And then I believe it was Peter that said, where are we going? You the one got the words of life. <laughs> you know, so I can say to God, what am I living for if not for, if not for you? What am I, who am I living for if I'm not living for you? You know, and when we look at that as it relates to God, what am I living for if not for you? That, that is the key right there, my friend. That is the critical point right there. And even though God is, is a jealous God, the Bible tells us that God is a jealous God, He still gives us great latitude, gives us space to do things and enjoy things in life and to love people. He's a jealous God, but He's not a selfish God. No, my friend. It's not wrong to engage in various activities and enjoy life. No, it's not wrong to relate to people and love people and enjoy ways in which uh, we interact and express ourselves to one another, one another. That is not wrong. God is not opposed to us speaking highly of one another or celebrating one another. But at some point, God may begin to draw some things to our attention where we are lacking. Such as how can we talk about the uh, talk about the extremes to which we will go for her or for him, but question how far we should go for God, or even if you are too busy thinking about your baby, what does that? What does the Lord have to say to get your attention, my friend? Yes, we are living to make a living. We are living to raise a family. We are living, my friend, to build a career. And yes, we are living to achieve our goals in life to reach our destiny in life. But in all of that, and above all of that, we can never forget that we are living for the Lord to do His will and to serve this present age, my friend. With everything else going on, it's easy to forget our purpose or our reason for being, our reason for living. It should not be, my friend, but it's easy to forget who created us and why he created us and for whom he created us. So we say, what am I living for if not for you? And when you think, listen, my friend, when you think, think about it. It's a great question to ask. And it's a wonderful reminder of what our real purpose in life should be, that we ought to be living for God. That may be some, something that we want to ask ourselves every few weeks or so. What am I living for if not for you? To get us back centered, to get us back focused. It is both a question and a statement of fact. Listen, we also have to sometimes inform other people or even remind them that because we're living for the Lord, our time, our energy is spent differently now than what they may be doing. We're not saying they're bad, they're wrong. We're just saying, I'm at a different place now and I'm doing things differently. Listen, we use our resources differently. Okay? So we're just kind of uh, uh, moving in a different way at a different time. Uh, our priorities may not be what their priorities are. Our priorities are different. And therefore, we cannot always be available for them. 
Are you hearing me? Yes, I live for my family. I live for my ministry. I live for my children and for my grandchildren. Yes, and I even live for the church family. But if I find that God is not getting the first, the best, the most, listen, if I find that God is not getting all of me, I'm talking all of me, okay? Let me say it this way. If God is not getting most of me, okay? Yeah, because he does allow us time with family, time with friends and all of that. But if, I, if God is not getting the best of me, if God is not getting the most of me, if God is not getting the first of me, then we have a problem. Oh, I'm grateful. Thankfully, I can spend time with, uh, with other people as I spend time with the Lord. But it's always, what am I living for if not for you, Lord God? If he is the giver of life, if he is the sustainer of life, and if he is the, the essence of life, listen, my friend, if we aren't living for him, then how much living are we doing? I mean, if I can share expressions of love and admiration to others, listen, when I can tell them, I love you until the day I die, I love you dearly, I'll never leave you. If I can say that to them, if I can say, you're my everything, then when it comes to God, is the best that we can do, is the best that we can come up with, is a dry, worn out, praise the love. Listen, my friend, I believe that if God were our date, if God was our friend, he would have walked out on us a long time ago with no more time than we have to give him, with no more of our resources that we can share with him, and with no better expression of our love for him than what we are currently giving him. Listen, let's ask the question, what is there for God to get excited about? Have you told him lately that you love him? Have you lifted him up? I'm talking about really lifted him up in praise. Have you, my friend, demonstrated to God that you are living for him? Have you convinced him that you are living for him? What assurance does God have that we are indeed living for him? Not just living for ourselves, not just living for our families, but he has priority in our lives. Are we taking him seriously or are we taking him for granted? Are we seeking to be used of him or are we seeking to use him? Do we play our best songs for him? Do we do our best dance for him? Do we, listen, do we save our best words for him? Do we dress uh, our best clothes for him? Listen, and are we on our best behavior for him? Are we really living for him? Those are some pretty good indicators uh, that tell the world and that says to us and that says to God that we are living for him. Listen, is our praise for him overshadowed by our praise for others? Are we talking love talk more than other people that we are to God? Is he getting the best of our time? Is he getting the best of our energy? Is he getting the best of our resources? Or is he getting what we have left? Who is it that is so heavy on our mind and on our hearts that we can't eat, we can't sleep at night? You remember that? You know, you're so infatuated, so in love, we thought it. I don't have an appetite. I can't. Who got you all shook up like that? Who got you singing those love songs? Who got you writing those love notes? Huh? Who got who got who has you writing those sweet poems late in the midnight hour? Huh? <laughs> Listen, what am I living for if not for you, Lord? I wonder if we say that to God. Lord, what am I living for if not for you? What would be his response? Would he call the names of others? whom we deem more important in life than he is? Or would he run off a list of things that have seemingly taken his place in our lives? Listen, the ideal situation would be that there's no question about it. No, no question in my mind, no question in his mind. It's clear as a bell, indeed, we are living for him. That's the ideal. We need not ask anyone else. We need not take a poll or complete a questionnaire. We need only ask ourselves, what am I living for? If not for him. 
What is the driving force behind my getting up every day? What is my motive for preaching, teaching, and seeking to save that which is lost, if not for Him? What inspires me? What calls me to action? And what is the joy of my life and my ministry that I hear him, listen, that I can hear him say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. <laughs> my friend, that's what I want to hear. The scripture tells us in Romans 14, 7 and 8, it says for, listen, for none of us live it to himself and no man die to himself. For whether we live, we live unto the Lord. And whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord's. And that sums it up much better than I ever could. For Paul, he was sold out for Christ. His life was absorbed by the life of Jesus Christ. His life was saturated with the life of Christ. He lost his identity in Jesus Christ. In other words, without Christ, he was not. Did you hear what I said? Without Christ, he was not. Without Christ, my friend, I am not. Without Christ, you are not. What am I living for if not for him? Without him, I am not. Not just that I am nobody. I am not without him. What does a life lived for the Lord looks like? What does it look like? What does it feel like? You know, what does it look like to have, um, for us to have one singular purpose for our being and yet be ready and yet be available to serve humanity? What is it about us that well, we can say that I am uh, living for the Lord, even though I can still serve humanity, I can still be a blessing to people? What am I really living for? What is the... Uh, evidence that I am living for the Lord. And I know that we're not trying to, so to speak, prove anything to anybody else, but we are trying to demonstrate our faithfulness. We are trying to, through our lives, witness to the goodness of Jesus Christ. Okay? So let's begin with one thing, my friend. Let's begin here. Never think that you are living for the Lord or that you can live for the Lord if you cannot or if you are not living with your own brother or your sister in Christ. The Bible says, how can we claim that we love the Lord whom we have never seen and yet hate our brother, hate our sister that we see every day? So there is absolutely no way. If you cannot live, well, I just can't get along with them. Well, I just can't live with them. Well, I just can't work with them. If you cannot live with your brother or your sister in Christ, then you, my friend, let me put it this way, then there is some question about whether or not you are living for the Lord. All right? Are you with me? There's some question about it because uh, when I live for the Lord, that enables me to live with you. <laughs> yeah, you know, to get along with you. Uh, when I live for the Lord, He gives me strength. He gives me wisdom. He gives me knowledge. He gives me the power that I need to overcome the obstacles of life. All right? So I cannot say, I cannot say, uh, oh, what am I living for if not for you? If I am not living with my brother and my sister in Christ, if I am not able to work with them, to serve with them. Amen? So uh, we have to look at it. What does it mean when we say that uh, I am living for the Lord? Okay? Secondly, listen, when the majority of our life is taken by something else or someone else, we cannot make the claim that we are living for the Lord. Did you hear what I just said? I said, when someone else, when something else is taking up the majority of our time, the majority of our energy, the majority of our resources, then we cannot make the claim that we are living for the Lord. Are you hearing me? As a matter of fact, all one has to do sometimes is take a look at our checkbook, take a look at our calendar, and take a look on our Facebook page, and that will tell the whole story for whom we are living. Yeah. Where's all your money going? Where are your resources going? Look at your calendar. Where's all your time going? Who are you spending the most time with? Look at your Facebook page because you tell it all. You tell it all. 
So how can we say that we're living for the Lord? How can we ask God, what am I living for if not for you? When it seems that everybody else and everything else is getting the majority of our time, our resources, our energy, my friend, even our praise. We spend more time telling him, telling her how much we love them. Why don't you talk to God like that sometimes? Why, why not make God your biggest lover in life? All right? Then, listen, uh, if we're living for the Lord, there is evidence of living for the Lord. A uh, fruit, my friend, is harvested from a life lived for the Lord. I'll say it again. I said fruit is harvested from a life lived for the Lord. It yields much fruit. It yields more fruit. And our fruit remains. Yes, absolutely. When we live for the Lord, it is, it is, uh, it is productive. When we live for the Lord, there's some fruit to show for our life, for living for the Lord. There's much fruit. There uh, is more fruit, and our fruit remains. All right? Uh, are you living for the Lord? All right? I am not living for the Lord when I have more to say to you and when I have more to say about you than I have to say to the Lord and that I have to say about the Lord. I'm not living for the Lord. If I got more to say about you than I have about him, then I'm not living for the Lord. If I have more good to say about you all than I have to say about God. No. God gets the attention, my friend. God gets it. I have to say to the Lord, and I have to talk about him, how good he is. He gets the love songs. He gets the love letters. And he gets the poems, the promises, the pledges, and the praises. Listen, my friend, living for the Lord, there are no comparisons to compare. It, listen, there are no comparisons. There's nowhere in the world that, uh, you know, and sometimes you have to remind people because people complain about little things and this and when you talk to somebody over here, when you do something over there. Uh, have you been around people like that that um, they seem they're always comparing your relationship with them and your relationship with something else or with somebody else. They're always talking like there's a competition and then you have to remind them sometimes, wait a minute, there's no competition between you and that, you and those. No, there's no comparison there. We are not, you are not competing for my love. There's no question about my love for you. What are you talking about? Listen, my friend, because when we start comparing, we begin competing. Are you hearing me? And nobody is nowhere near being in competition with my God. You don't even come close. There would be no confusion about it. You lose every time. Are you hearing me? Let us not forget our purpose in life, my friend. Let us not forget. Listen, living for the Lord is to worship Him. Living for the Lord is to work for him, to serve him, to serve humanity. Living for the Lord is to witness for him, to testify, to show the world how good he is. Let them hear you talk about how good, let them hear you talk about how you love him. Have you changed your life for the one who changed your life? I said, have you changed your life for the one who changed your life? Have you changed your purpose? Have you changed your priorities? Have you changed your preferences? And have you changed your praise? My praise for you will never supersede my praise for him. He will always get the best. He will always get the most. All to the glory of God. Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I but Christ liveth in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Who am I living for if not for you, Lord? I don't want there to be any question about it. I am living for you. Father God, we thank you so much. We bless you and we praise you. Thank you, Lord, for speaking to our hearts and speaking to our minds. 
God bless us on tomorrow for what we call Thanksgiving Day, time that many of us will spend with family and friends. Keep us safe. Keep us focused. And God, help us to write you some love letters. Help us, Lord God, to recite some poems for you, to talk about how much we love you, to talk about what we'll do for you, talk about the extent to which we'll go to preserve our relationship with you. God, we bless you and we thank you and we love you, Lord. Bless us, keep us, guide and lead us in your will and in your way. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, hurry and go check on the turkey. I want you to have yourself a wonderful day on tomorrow and may God bless you real good. What am I living for if not for you, Lord God? No, it's all for you. Get out of here. We got to go eat some turkey and ham. I'll see you later. God bless you.